This video is about the um, 2011 AP Calculus AB exam uh, for response question number three. There is no calculator allowed on this question. Um, a couple years ago they changed to having two calculator allowed questions and then four no calculator allowed. It used to be three and three but now it's two and four. Um, okay, so in this question, they say let R be the region in the first quadrant enclosed by the graphs f of x and g of x as shown in the figure above. And part A wants us to write an equation for the line tangent to the graph of f at x equals 1 half. Um, so it's not really a big deal for part A. For part B and C, it'll make a difference. But um, it's good for us just to notice that the one on the bottom here is f and the one on the top is g. Oops, g. Let's get rid of that. Um, okay. Um, again, that's not really a big deal for f because they gave us the equations, but or for part a rather because they gave us the equations. But for b and c, that will make a difference. F is on the bottom, g is on the top. Um, so to write the equation of the tangent line we basically the easiest thing to do is to say is to treat this like point slope form much easier than slope intercept form so in point slope form I need to know a point x1 and y1 and the slope the point they already gave us not only did they give us x1 here being one half but they also, if you look at the picture, gave us the corresponding y-coordinate, which is 1. So I already know this is going to be y minus 1 is equal to m times x minus 1 half. And if they hadn't given us this 1 for the y, we could have just plugged in 1 half for f of x and gotten the, and we would have found the 1. But they did it for us, so no sense wasting time on that. Now we need to find m, the slope. Well, the slope, of course, since they're asking for the tangent line, is just the value of the derivative at that point. So, let's find that. Let's first find f prime of x. f prime of x, easy enough. Power rule. Multiply. 8 times 3 is 24. x cubed minus 1 for the exponent is x squared. Um, just be careful in the AP exam. Don't confuse your power rule for derivatives with your power rule for antiderivatives common mistake, don't let yourself make that. Just think about what am I doing, derivative or antiderivative. Uh, and then we need f prime of 1 half, so that's going to be 24 times 1 half squared. 1 half squared is of course 1 fourth, so 1 fourth of 24 is 6. So the slope of the tangent line at that point is 6. We take our 6 and we plug it in for the m over here and we get y minus 1 is equal to 6 times x minus 1 half. And this is the answer to part A. Pretty straightforward. Um, don't waste any time converting it into point slope form, or into slope intercept form, because it's literally a waste of time. This is an equation, so you're done. All right, on to part B. In part B, we have to find the area of the region R. And in this one, it is going to be important for us to know that it is F on the bottom. Let's see if I can make a better G this time. And G, a little better, on the top. Um, when you find the area between two curves, it's always the integral of the curve on the top minus the curve on the bottom. So we had to recognize that um, G was on top. So for part B, now we're in part B, it is the integral. We know that the boundaries are in terms of x, so from 0 to 1 half of G of x, which is sine of pi x minus f of x, which is 8x cubed cubed dx. Area underneath a curve is the integral, and then the area between two curves is just the difference of the integrals. 
Um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this is the non-calculator allowed section, so we do need to actually calculate this antiderivative. Um, for the sine of pi x, because it's pi x, we actually need to do what we call u substitution, or the substitution rule here. Um, when you do that, you will get 1 over pi times sine, or it's not sine anymore, 1 over pi times the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine, so I'm going to put the negative out front, negative 1 over pi cosine of pi x, minus than the antiderivative. Now this time it's the antiderivative power rule, so I need to add 1 to the exponent, so it'll be x to the fourth, and then um, divide by that, so then 8 divided by 4 is going to give me 2 x to the fourth, and I'm evaluating this from 0 to 1 half. Um, just in case we want a quick little review of the um, how we did the sine of pi over x, uh, sine of pi times x, the integral of that. If I had the integral of sine of pi x dx, because this is not just an x, but there's extra stuff in here, that tells me I need to do the substitution rule or u substitution, depending on what your book called it. So we would let u equal pi x, then we take the derivative of that, and so du, to show all the work technically, du dx is just equal to pi, and then du, multiply the dx on the other side, is equal to pi dx, and so then I can take the pi, bring that to the other side, and 1 over pi du is equal to dx. So now, the purpose of this is I'm trying to take this with the pi, the pi x inside and replace it with a u because that's simpler. But then if I turn this into a u, I need to turn this into a du. So I need to replace dx with what we just said dx equals. So then now my integral becomes the integral of sine of u du, but I need that 1 over pi, so I just, because it's a constant multiple, I can actually just kick it to the outside, and that's not going to affect how I actually take the integral. So then it's 1 over pi, antiderivative of sine is negative cosine, so I put the negative out front, cosine of u, and then I just substitute back in for u, so 1 over pi cosine of pi times x. And hopefully we're pretty good with that. Um, I mean, at this point in the year you should, you should know how to do a, a basic u substitution like that. But I just wanted to review it just to, just to double check. Um, so let's oops. All right. So now that we've reviewed that, basically all you need to do from here is just plug in the two numbers and then subtract. Um, so I am going to I'm going to go ahead and get rid of all this work that we just did over here because um, I need more room. So let's get rid of this. We've seen how it happened. If you need to see it again, rewind. That'll give me enough room. Okay, um, so now that that's gone, now let's plug in. So then we have the one half plugged in, so that's negative one over pi times cosine. When I plug pi in, that's now cosine of pi over two. Then minus, when I plug one half in to x, one half to the fourth, and then times 2 gives me minus 1 eighth. And then I'm subtracting again when I plug in the 0. 
When I plug in 0, that's going to be cosine of 0, which is 1, so just negative 1 over pi. And then when I plug in 0 to the next part, that's just going to be 0. 0x zero to the fourth times 2 is just 0. <coughs> Fortunately, cosine of pi over 2 is also 0. So really what we have here is negative 1 eighth and then minus the negative, so plus 1 over pi. And you don't need to worry about a common denominator or anything like that. This is a perfect answer. Um, you might have talked a lot about how you don't need to simplify in um, on the AP Calculus exam. That's true. So technically you could have stopped one step above. Once you've plugged in the two um, limits of your integral, then you can stop. Um, this is probably the best answer though, just right here. Um, yeah. Alright, on to part C. Again, in part C, it is um, no calculator, but here they're very kind to us and they say write but do not evaluate. So we just have to set up the integral expression for the volume of the solid generated when r is rotated about the horizontal line y equals 1. Let's look at that horizontal line first. So a horizontal line y equals 1 is going to go right through there. Well, I didn't draw that perfectly, but it should have gone right through the intersection. Um, <clears throat> so if the solid is generated when r is rotated around that horizontal line, then there's going to be a hole in our solid. There's going to be this empty space. All of this will be empty, and we'll get this um, big three-dimensional shape, but the, it will have this empty space in it. Um, so that tells me that we would use what is typically called the washer method, where essentially you take the integral of the outside cylinder minus the inside cylinder. And in order to do that, you have to basically treat it as having two different radii. Uh, the radius for the outside cylinder, which goes from the um, axis of rotation, so the y equals 1, to the farther away shape, and then the inside radius, which goes from the axis to the closer shape. So in this case, it's not just top minus bottom anymore. You have to be um, careful to think about what is farther away from the line you're spinning it around. So, as we can pretty clearly see, the F is actually farther away. And the way I like to show this um, is I like to do a big radius. So this distance here, that's my big radius. So I like to call that capital R. And then the distance to the closer part, that I like to call little r because it's my smaller radius. And so when you set this up, the, the washer method, as I like to call it, because it has a hole in it like a washer, um, it's basically pi times the integral from, this is the general format, from a to b of big R squared minus little r squared, and then dx or dy, depending. Um, <clears throat> And the pi is on the outside because essentially we're taking the um, volume of two different cylinders and we're subtracting them. And you can take the pi, which is part of the formula for the volume of a cylinder, and it's in both formulas and factor that out. Same for the dx. The dx is actually sort of like the height of each cylinder, and so I can factor that out of the two volumes and just leave the difference between the two radii. Um, so the big R we just saw from the picture goes from the y equals 1 to the um, f of x. So big R is actually 1 minus f of x. And little r is going to be 1 minus g of x. Uh, and this can get a little bit weird. Um, but let's review it here. The value of the function, so the value of f of x, when we say f of x here, that's how far it goes up from the x axis. So this little distance that I'm highlighting here, that's f of x. 
1 would go all the way from the x-axis up to my blue line here. So if I take that whole distance, 1, minus the little value of f of x here, I would get this distance that I've shown as big R, the distance from the axis of rotation to the curve. And same for g of x. The value of g of x is this distance from the x-axis up to the curve. So when I take 1, the whole distance minus the value of g of x, I'm left with just this little chunk right here. So when I set this up, because they wanted me to write it but not evaluate it, I will just say it is the integral, or rather pi first, times the integral from 0 to 1 half of, in parentheses, 1 minus f of x, which was 8x cubed, squared minus 1 minus g of x, which was the sine of pi x, also squared, and then dx. And that's my answer. Um, <clears throat> just remember this general format for um, any time you have a wash or a hole in your solid that you, that you make when you rotate. Um, and then the most common mistake that people make is they forget to square the two radii separately. You have to square them separately. And be careful that when you spin it around a line other than the x-axis, you might have to do some adding or subtracting. In this case, it was adding. Just be careful. Think about what is the actual distance. The actual distance from the line I'm spinning it around is the radius. So it's not just the function value f of x. It's 1, the whole thing, minus the little function value f of x. 1 minus f of x. 1, the whole thing, minus the function value g of x. Leaves me with this little radius right here. And that is how you set that up. And that's the end of uh, FRQ number 3 from 2011. All right, hope you enjoyed that.